Here we are in our final message in the series, The Greatest Avenger, and we've been answering this question. Here we go again. Okay, so we've been answering this question all summer. And so here it is. Who is the greatest Avenger? Who do you guys really believe is the greatest Avenger? Throw it out there. We have God. Yes, he is the greatest Avenger. Yes, Thor, okay, the God of Thunder. Hulk, we got Hulk, okay. So today we're talking about Captain America, better known as Steve Rogers. And if you saw him curling, that actually they, they photoshopped to my biceps so you guys could see those when he was holding that helicopter. I didn't know if you knew that. But Steve Rogers is probably the most infamous Avenger known for loyalty known for integrity, known for honor. I mean, if you don't know the background of this guy, here's the quick background. He's from the 1940s. Did you guys know that? He was this rinky-dink, less than 100-pound man who had all these birth complications, and all he wanted to do was serve his country. All he wanted to do was to fight against Nazi Germany to take down the enemy because this was a man who would do anything in his power for the greaterment of the world. And so here it is. He tried to sneak in multiple times to pass this physical, and he never passed because he never had the ability. He never had the size. He never had the health. And so one day, the scientist saw him, and he saw something in him, so he enrolled him into this super soldier program. And in this program, they would go to camp, they would go to this fort, and they would, they would be a part of this elite team of soldiers, and whoever passed, whatever the test was, what they were looking for would be part of this experiment where they would have this serum put into them, and they would become a super soldier. And so the whole time, he didn't fit in. You have the best of the best, the biggest, the strongest, the smartest, the soldiers that looked like they were the ones set up for the serum. And then you have Steve Rogers, and he's failing at everything. He can't run with them. He's behind. He can't do the same amount of push-ups that they're doing and pull-ups, and the, and the obstacle courses. He couldn't pass anything. And here is this, this uh, general who's looking at him. He's like, man, this guy's got nothing. Why did you put him in this program? You know how hard we've worked to even set up this program. Why would you allow him to be part of this? But the scientist saw something in him, something that no one else saw. He said, listen, if you want to be a part of this program, you have to have some other intangibles. And so we're going to watch a clip, take a look at this to see what Steve Rogers had to become known as Captain America. Let's go ahead and watch that. You're like a gerbil. Look at that. He's making me cry. Hodge passed every test we gave him. He's big, he's fast, he obeys orders, he's a soldier. He's a bully. You don't win wars with niceness, doctor. You win wars with guts. Get away! Get back! Tell me, grenade. Is this a test? He's still skinny. <laughs> so we see this clip, right? And we see the, the young Steve Rogers. And he throws out this grenade, and, and before even thinking, he just jumped on it, right? And so we see that, and we're just blown away by this quality, this great quality that he would do anything in his power to protect. And so in this series, we've been taking and gleaning from these Avengers some things that we can apply in our walk with Christ. And we talked about Spider-Man, how he was young and he wanted to prove himself. We talked through scripture that let no one look down on your youthfulness, but with your conduct, with your speech, with all these attributes, be an example actually to the household of believers. 
And I believe we're doing that here. I believe that some of you, you are examples. You think that someone that is middle-aged or elderly, that, that they would be the example to you. I believe some of you are being examples to them by the qualities you possess. And so we talked about that, but Spider-Man, he was still young, so he always had that chip on his shoulder. He wanted to prove himself. He wanted to show that he, that he wasn't a kid. Then a couple weeks ago, I mean, we talked about, Justin brought a message on Iron Man. He was so unashamed. It's like if anyone brings up religion or what we believe, it's like we, we curl away and we're afraid. It's like, I, I don't want to go there because we're afraid what they're, what they're going to think. He was unashamed. Then we talk about the big green dude, right? By the name of Hulk. And I wish we had more boldness in us. I wish that we were more known for our faith. And of course, Thor, which all the ladies love the message on Thor, and talking about him, and, and in that message we talked about, was he Thor, the god of hammers? And we learned that his power, which he possessed, was not actually in the hammer. It was in himself. And we have the very spirit of God that lives within us. That God's very spirit resides in us if we've given our lives to him. Well, now we're talking about Captain America and what are some qualities, what are some things that we can take from Captain America and we can see and apply it to our walk with Christ. And I believe the first point is this. This is something we can take. Captain America did not bend from what he believed. When there was a pushing against him, when there was a challenge against what he believed, he didn't bend. He was very finite in what he believed. And so when thinking about that, there's a scene that I love, and it's a scene in the movie with the funeral of one of his friends. Her name was Peggy Carter. And some of you know the movie that in the first Avenger, the first Avenger, which was called, you know, Captain America, the first Avenger, he ended up going down in a plane into a pile of ice. And so he was frozen for 70 years and then came out of the ice and it was still alive, right? It's a, it's a movie. And he ended up having one person that he still knew that was alive. And it was Peggy Carter. She was one of the agents that started S.H.I.E.L.D. That was where Captain America worked for. And so we see in this that, that she was old and he would go and he'd spend time with her at the hospital, but eventually she passed away. And at her funeral, he was at a crossroad. There was issues going on all over the world and he was struggling what to do, whether to bend to the world or to stand firm. And so we're going to watch this clip and we're going to see kind of that confliction of his heart. So let's take a look and see what's happening with Captain America at the funeral. And now I would like to invite Sharon Carter to come up and say a few words. Margaret Carter was known to most as a founder of S.H.I.E.L.D. But I just knew her as Aunt Peggy. She had a photograph in her office, Aunt Peggy standing next to JFK. As a kid, that was pretty cool. But it was a lot to live up to, which is why I never told anyone we were related. I asked her once how she managed to master diplomacy and espionage in a time when no one wanted to see a woman succeed at either. And she said, compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say, no, you move. Okay, what's happening here, and some of you have seen the movie, if you haven't, there's this thing that happened in Sokovia. And so the world was trying to set up what is known as the Sokovia Accords, which for the Avengers, to all these superheroes, was to bind them. 
It was to say, you guys can only be used if called upon. You're no longer an autonomous, a free organization moving to try to keep the world safe. So Captain America was struggling with that. And he said he was struggling with that because man has agendas. There's always hidden agenda. And he said, no, I signed up for this. I chose to do this to protect man. But if man controls it, then it will eventually fail. But here's the issue. His best friends were trying to push him away. They were trying to get him to sign this. Black Widow. War Machine. Vision. And one of his closest friends, Iron Man. They were trying to get him to sign these accords because they believed it was best, but in his heart of hearts, he knew it was wrong, and he chose not to bend. And so we see that line. When the world tells you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell them, no, you move. And so with that, it was so interesting because when I heard that line, Guys, that's scripture. You wonder where some of these movies get these lines. You wonder where they come from. Guys, this is straight from the word of God. Listen to this. We're going to put it up on the screen. Psalm 1. It says, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. It continues in the next slide to say this. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. We, we see this. What does this mean for us? It's like the strongest of trees are those that are planted in the right things. And the best place to be planted is by the river because you have a never-ending source of energy. The source was the water. And so a lot of us, you know, we're not planted by the water. We're planted in places that don't keep us grounded. We're planted in the things of life that, that almost push us away. Oh, excuse me. And so we see in Scripture the challenge, and it says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, be strong and immovable. Oh. Be strong and and immovable. A lot of us, strong and immovable are not qualities that we, we associate with us. It's more like weak and flaky and soft. As the wind blows, we, we fall. And so we see in here that we are called to be strong and immovable, but that means we got to be planted by the water. We got to be planted in the right things. And that's what Cap was. He was planted in the right thing. For us, what does that mean? We have to be planted in Christ. We don't accidentally fall into a good relationship with Christ, y'all. We don't accidentally trip into good friendships. We don't accidentally move into the right community or, or have the right church. I've never seen it. I've never once seen someone accidentally become a holy and righteous person. It takes work. Because the world will say, bend. We know that. The world will say, no, no, you move. But our job is to say, no, you move. So the question is, is what are we bending with? What is it right now that we're bending with? A second thing we learn from Captain America is he was the same publicly as he was privately. It wasn't just a show. He didn't, he didn't put on a show just to make people feel all right. And I think scripture supports this in Proverbs 28, 6. This is what it says. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. What does that mean? It's better for us to live a life of integrity. It's better for us to do what's right and be very poor than to do what's wrong and make money. It's, in our context, because a lot of us don't make a lot of money, it's better for us to be not popular 
and do what's right than to be popular and sacrifice what you believe. It's better for us to stand on the side of misfit, outcast, you know, a word we've used, renegade, than stand on the side to be loved, liked, and accepted because there's something we compromise with. So we see with Captain America, he was always, always, always the same person. If you look at his first film to even the most recent film, he always was consistent. He was immovable and he was strong. And so in our lives, we have to know that God desires for us to be the same when we're here or when we're not. There's another verse from the book of Proverbs, verse 11.3. It says, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Does anyone know what that word duplicity means? Two-faced. Duplicity. Some of us, we live in the place of duplicity. Some of us, that has been something, that, that's all we know, actually. We've never once lived in a place that wasn't one of duplicity. Some other words that we can associate with that, just so we get an idea, is deception, dishonesty, betrayal, or fraudulent. And I stand on the stage and say, I lived in the world of duplicity. When I first surrendered my life to Christ, you want to know someone who struggled with that? It was me. You know, you can claim him with your words. You can claim him on the outside. But in my life, in my heart, within my actions, I was so fraudulent. Whether it was music or movies or language, you name it. Those were things that there was constantly a war. But here's the thing, God is so much bigger than those things. The reason why those were a struggle is because I thought that was the means of my change. I thought I would be good if I changed my actions. When God said, your actions don't change anything. Let me change your heart and then I'll take care of the rest. And so I lived in the world of duplicity. Captain America didn't. He was consistent across the board, which led to the third point. Because he was consistent across the board, he was even consistent with the highest call. There's a verse that says, those who are faithful with the little things will be faithful with the big things. Those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much. And so that means even when we have these little moments, that there will be a day where God will call us to a big moment. A little moment might be like, hey, you're not that person who's a Christian, are you? Oh, yes, I am. That's a little moment, a little defense of the gospel. Big thing might be one day you guys are in a position, you're in a job that they're asking you to do something that is against what you believe, and you choose to stand and stand firm in the fact that you're a Christ follower before a boss follower. And you have to make that decision. And so we find out in the third point, when when Captain America was challenged to the highest call, he was still consistent, and this is it. He was willing to pay the ultimate cost. Here it is, guys. He was willing to pay the biggest cost. I might get some haters out here, but this is what made Captain America the greatest Avenger. He was the greatest Avenger, not because he was the strongest Avenger. Guys, think about it. All he had was a shield. He didn't have a giant hammer that was made from a dying star. He didn't turn into a big green buff dude. He wasn't like Spider-Man climbing buildings and shooting webs out of his hands. Guys, he was a man with some really good juice that made him buff. Really, think about it. Like seriously, it was a serum. And then after that, we see everything, everything with him stayed the same. It stayed consistent. He said this line, the price of freedom is high, it always has been, and it's a price I am willing to pay. This is what makes Captain America the greatest. 
because he was willing to die for a greater cause. It's what scripture says in John 15. It says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. No greater call in life. No greater thing that we can be called by God Almighty to do than to die for someone else. And that's what he did. He was willing to die. We see in the first Avenger that there was a moment when he was in this plane and he knew that he wouldn't be able to land it. And if he, he didn't, then it would be to kill thousands of people. And he chose to bury that plane in the ice, to take his life rather than live. Guys, Jesus did that for you. Jesus took down that plane for you. Jesus chose to die for you. And some of you, maybe you've never accepted that. As we go in this last song, we want you to know the single greatest avenger isn't built on someone because of their characteristics or the weapons they have. It's built on who they are in here. Because what we see is not what God sees. He says that. I look at something else. And so you might say, I don't measure up. I don't have all the characteristics that other people have, but God's not looking, he's, he's looking at here. So remember the words, remember the challenges, remember what we just heard, to not bend. Remember to be consistent and to remember and remember that God paid the ultimate cost for you. Let's pray. God, thank you that we can come here this morning. We know that we we all fail. As we sing this song, let's remember that you paid the ultimate cost. That your love was through an action, and that action was the cross. It was through nails and wood and pain and tears, and it was for each and every person in this room. I thank you that we can come, come here and celebrate that, but also if there's someone here that hasn't accepted that, let this morning be the time. We love you, God. We pray this all in your name. Amen.